Live from the Hippodrome in London. Tonight, Isabel and James are joined by Mitch Firesteed, best-selling author of Planet Ponzi, and Alan D. Miller, businessman and freedom campaigner. The Speakeasy is now open. So everyone, welcome to the Speakeasy. Um, this is our first meeting, the opening of the salon. Um, it's funny to be here with James Melville because he and I used to be on opposite sides of the political debate. He on the left and me on the right. We kind of got the seating got here wrong, wrong, didn't we? Right, didn't we? <laughs> And the main thing we used to argue about was Brexit. Um, and then the pandemic came along and we kind of realised pretty quickly that there were way, way, way bigger things to be worrying about than whether the UK was going to still be part of the EU. Because we found ourselves in this kind of authoritarian dystopia and governments were beginning to interfere with every aspect of our lives in a way that I don't think any of us could possibly have foreseen before it happened. And now the pandemic's over and some people may feel that that level of interference and state control has has gone away, that it was just a pandemic thing, that it was needed for our protection. They, these were temporary emergency measures. Um, but I think it's changed everything and raised real questions about the way governments behave uh, and, you know, the future of our freedom, really. And whether there's some kind of bigger picture here um, and I don't mean that in a kind of conspiracy theory kind of way um, but one thing that I think that the pandemic experience has taught us is that there are a lot of vested interests around and I think we'd love to unpick some of that and fundamentally our freedoms are as much at stake as they were. So that's kind of what we're here to talk about with this podcast series, the power of the state and the importance of our individual freedoms and whether there are bigger things uh, than coronavirus going on. So we wanted to start actually with what's happening to cash because I'm noticing all over the place now that an awful lot of places are no longer taking cash uh, they're presenting this as if this is a good thing, we're, we're cash free, as if this is some kind of boast. And I'm wondering whether there's more to that than meets the eye. Uh, what does it mean for us? Why is cash disappearing? Um, is it a good thing? Uh, and so it's great to have um, our two guests, which James, you're going to do a bit of an introduction. Yeah, I mean, talk about these. It's, I think it's hilarious that we've come together on this, um, considering the squabbles that we had for quite a long time over Brexit. We might Brexit. end up falling out again. We, <laughs> we might do. Who knows if we get through the series? We'll find something to squabble about. But what we wanted to do is basically really scrutinise certain issues around all this. It feels to me like an existential crisis that we're going on in terms of freedom. Yeah. And for me, I'd, for, I'd taken for granted freedoms. There was a Brexit debate, and I was consumed by that. But then, the last two years, it feels on so many different levels our freedoms are up for grabs. And I'm not in any way a conspiracy theorist. But there's certain components that have happened over the last two years that do actually feel interconnected. Mm -hmm. There's aspects in terms of public health policy, there's aspects in terms of digital ID, there's aspects in terms of control, authoritarianism, and certainly finance and also the economic structures around, as well, around the world as well. So our first guest on our first podcast, first of all, Mitch Firestein, who has got this amazing book, Planet Ponzi, which I read over the last couple of weeks. He's and been going on about this for I, ages. I'm in love with this book. And Thank you. But that's part of the reason being here. I want to learn from this as well. And I want to sort of shape my own thoughts and hopefully can shape further discussions about where we're going with all this. It's a fantastic book that's chapter and verse about what has happened with the financial model. Effectively, I would say, it's a historical context, but going back largely to the financial crash 2008, 2009. So Mitch is gonna talk about that in terms of the backstory and where we are today and what potentially some risks and concerns in the future about where we're going. And also Alan, Alan Miller. Where do I start with Alan Miller? He an absolute doyen within the nightclub industry, sort of Mr. Nighttime, I would say, in, in London, but also has been a huge champion of that whole industry over the last couple of years, which has been decimated in many parts because of the stupid restrictions and rules, and also from an employment structure, it's 
it's difficult for those industries to see their way through it because the rules are changing on a, on a, almost a day by day basis through lockdowns. But also in terms of the current form, to get together declaration. Now, Alan, I think more than almost anyone else, has been like the community champion of restrictions, lockdowns, and what's happened from that with the collateral damages. A major campaigner that's galvanized people around the country, brought a great subscription base, but also an understanding, that's what Alan said today, about what's happening in the real economy with certain industries and, and hospitality. So these are our first two wonderfully loquacious guests. And I'm gonna stop talking and ask some questions in a second. So Mitch, first of all, I'd like to ask you, based on the fact that these components are coming together, whether it's digital ID, whether it's finance, whether it's loss of freedom and more government control. I think we need to rewind a little bit here and look back at the financial model, and it, which is mentioned in the book about how have we got here? Where do you think this started? Where, where, when you have a roadmap of finance in terms of where we are today, what were the wor warning signs? Where did this initiate from? And where do you think this is going in the future? Well, that's a great question, and I wanted to thank you both for having me on your first podcast, and I wanted to give you a gift that it was highly significant of today's day. A hundred trillion dollars. This oh, is real. Wow. Unless I'm no, Scottish, is, I will take that. This is, <laughs> yeah, this is, this He's going to want more. This is a real hundred trillion dollar note, and this is an example of what happens with modern monetary theory when you just love print this. infinite quantities of money. I love this. Right? Look at so that. that's what happens. That's part of it. Now, if you want to get into the backstory, the book is about how we got into this mess, what happens next, and what you need to do to protect yourselves. So everything that I, I believe is is connected to economics in one way or another. Now that we're seeing different paradigm shifts, we have the media that we've got to examine, finance, com communication, social media, regular media, government, and education that's become indoctrination. So if we go back to the causes, the root causes, as it were, we have too much debt, too much credit, and too much leverage. So when you print massive amounts of money, you get a, a crisis. Now, historically, in any type of crisis that you have. We had first long-term capital management, which was 1998, which was a firm run by James, um, James Merriweather, who was ex-Solomon Brothers. They lost a billion dollars, a billion dollars trading Russian debt when Russia defaulted for their first time on a debt, a bond obligation. That was 1998. That was replaced with the next crisis, which was the dot-com bomb, which was 1999 to 2001, where you saw the NASDAQ go from 5,200 intraday down to around 1,600. So this was quite a journey. That was quite a decline in the stock market. The next thing that replaced that crisis was, of course, the housing crisis, which Ben Bernanke said, subprime is contained. So you've got central bankers lying the entire way through, and we've got a repetitive theme that's going on here. Every time there's a crisis, they keep printing more money. This was from 1998 onwards. Print money, print money. So a billion was the first one. Dot com was closer to hundreds of billions of dollars in bailouts. Then you had the housing crisis, which was the next thing where subprime collapsed. And that, you know, that was over a trillion. And then, of course, we morphed on to COVID, which was multi-trillions of dollars. So if you examine where we've come, where we're going and where we are, or where we are and where we're going, you see that the amount of debt has increased exponentially. And Janet Yellen, who for the entire two decades of the ride has been involved in the Federal Reserve system, starting out at the San Francisco Federal Reserve and just being a yes person and sitting on the board and going, yes, yes, yes. And then she became chairman and took Ben Bernanke's reins, and she's been a magic money printer the entire time. So the, the solution is not to print more money and not to have infinite bailouts, which has happened in the UK as well. Now, if we want to shift over and look at what's going on in the UK economy, we go back to 2008 when the crisis hit. We had Merv, and, Merv the Swerve King, who was running the Bank of England here, I didn't make, wasn't, I wasn't one of his favorites. When I was doing a column at the Daily Mail, he complained about the stuff I was writing along with several other people, but it was factually and technically accurate and correct with the money printing because what people don't realize is sterling, the currency that we have in this country, went from 2.08 down to about 135. 
So that was a 34% decline. That's a currency devaluation. And this is what happens when you have excessive amounts of debt. You debase your currency, which is what they did. So the currency went down 34% to, to that 135 level. And now we've been in that range. And right now we've broken down to the downside. We're trading at 127 this morning in London. This so, is against the dollar, is uh, yeah, it? Again, yeah, every currency, every major currency is against the U.S. dollar. That's not me saying that. That's right. just the way it's quoted. So what we're seeing is a decline in every major fiat currency in the world. But this is the, the big decline came when Mervyn King started the bank bailouts, which we still own a large percentage of a couple of the banks. Those shares are worthless and will never be paid back. And did we learn any lessons from that? Of course, the politicians will tell you, oh, no, don't worry about that because we're never going to bail anybody out again. But that didn't last very long. Well, how's that money going into the real economy? That's the problem. You have money supply and velocity of yeah. money. So you're talking about the velocity of money, which is how, how much the money gets turned over in the actual economy, as opposed to just printing amounts of money. But you have several other issues and factors that come into play as well. Because when the debt goes up, the way that governments finance their debt the United States being a little bit having quite an advantage over the UK is they issue debt and then we have to talk about what currency is and the role that currency plays which is what you brought up and we're going to do so that. Yeah, right but so but so so to go back to the debt situation the problem with debt is the United States debt because the US has always been US dollar hegemony it's a, the reserve currency for the since 1913 so they've been the reserve currency for what, 100 and 112 years or something. And before that, for 400 years, the US, the sterling was the reserve currency. So people flock to the US dollar whenever there's a crisis, wrongly or rightly. But now, so when the US issues debt, the rest of the world buys the debt. The UK doesn't have the same option because not too many people want to invest in gilts. And now with yields, I remember from 1981, Yields were, you know, you were paying 20, there were 20% interest rates and they've come straight down in a straight line. And now real interest rates, when you inflation adjust, are negative. And this is really significant because now if you look at where the 10 year government bond, this is too boring, but if you look at where the government bonds in the US are trading, it's, it, it's up around two, two and change interest, but the inflation rate is probably 20%. So you're getting negative 18% on your money. So who would buy that? It's the worst investment in the world. That's why we're going to have a massive crisis that's coming. And what we need to do is we need to look at what's caused that. And I'm saying that too much debt, too much credit, too much leverage. And we've got a lot of zombie corporations valued over trillion, uh, over billions of dollars that don't make any money. And it's a record number. But I think it's also about the real economy. We touched on that as well. It's, it's for people to be made aware of where the problems are with all this stuff and how it's actually impacting us and actually to understand the situation as well. I mean, you must be see, you must have seen that over the years, especially since 2008, 2009. Well, I, yeah, indeed, but I just want to take it back a bit as well because I, I agree with a lot of what Mitch has said, but really since the 70s, particularly Britain has been sluggish in terms of productive development and growth. Uh, and I think that the risk aversion in terms of, you know, capitalism used to be about risk, the whole idea about engaging, investing in an unforeseen future, and increasingly, it's about diminishing that risk. It's about certainties, right? And we've seen that. And I also think that informs some of the approach towards the response to COVID, risk, fear. Mm -hmm. So just to take where we've gone from that, we've had a situation of the zombie economy, zombie companies where people wanted to invest in, uh, either as individuals, people invested much more in real estate and property, rather than uh, uh, because that seemed as a way that they could maybe get some money, really play, houses should be to live in. But companies and leading business people did not take a lead in the old Jack Welch's of this world yeah. and invest and develop and have creative destruction, allow companies to fail and new ones to be, and retraining and all of that. And I think it reflects a lack of leadership and an understanding. The old Keynesian versus monetarist ideas went away and there was a lack of a sense of creative ambition. And I think that actually, it wasn't that it, a lot of people saw what happened with COVID in particular and we, you know and what going on with the currencies and everything that it just immediately happened but you talked about nightlife and everything I think that the whole policy position in the last 15 or 20 years has been when in doubt 
regulate, often people locally and nationally haven't had really big ideas, ambitious plans to resolve problems, infrastructure, finance development, or even when people go out together, like around here where councils regulate more and more and say that people are a problem, the public are disgusting, they're all anti-social behaviour, rather than saying, look how we light up the streets and how brilliant. And then this problem comes along, right, that we have to face, and it's almost like all these trends get blown up on steroids, right, and they get it becomes a perfect storm of when in doubt regulate, control, 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 not even honesty, look, we don't really know what we're doing, right? We, we, but, but be a bit honest. And that would be nice, wouldn't it? It would have been yeah. lovely, right? To us, rather than say, it's the science, we're following the science. But that's how it's evolved as well, because at the start of this crisis, I know we're coming on to that, but at the start of this crisis, I just thought it was government ineptitude. I thought it was sheer panic that was causing a lot of stuff. And all this stuff was coming down the tracks, so we're literally throwing stuff at the wall. And then over time, you start seeing the patterns emerge and you see how things get interlinked. But it comes back to that point, and especially relevant with finance as well, is that people's choices based on fear. So people don't feel empowered anymore to actually go, I'm not buying that. I want to take some personal responsibility to do it my way and create a better life for me, my friends, my family, and so on. When you've got media and you've got government, you're trying to suppress that spirit of freedom then people get entrenched and they get stuck in a rut. And that particularly applies, I think, with financial decisions as oh, yeah. well. Well, you, you have to bring in as well, as Alan said, but you know, look, financialization is what I think you were raising. The issue of financialization and financial products. My field of expertise was always in new markets and new market develop, which was derivative products. So if you go back to, a derivative is an option, basically, on something. And these were created in the late 1990s when they started trading. And what it allowed you to do an option, debt is not a bad thing. Debt is an extremely good thing when it's used for pro product, productive reasons. But when you're using it to create financial assets and create 500 to one, 1,000 to one, or 300 to one leverage, that's gonna end badly. And the beginning of the end was when Bill Clinton was president and a guy named Larry Summers, I don't know if you know who, yeah. he's the bad penny that keeps coming back all the time. He, he convinced Bill Clinton, because he was working with some people at Citibank, to get rid of Glass-Steagall, which allowed for derivative products to go wild. And if you look, they took off massively. And I said, well, this is allowing children to play with toys that they don't really understand. And this is going to end really badly. So they were making a lot of money on these uh, financial trades. But then when the derivative products, which uh, Warren Buffett termed as uh, weapons of mass financial destruction, imploded, that's how we got crisis after crisis after crisis. Now the derivative exposures are astronomic right now. So we're going to have another crisis. It's inevitable. But as, as you were saying, an economy, when you have financialization and negative interest rates, when you're pumping a billion dollars into yeah. a company that has no chance of ever making money and you don't let it go bankrupt because interest rates are so low, they just service their debt and tick over. You can't have growth. Without growth, you have death and, and that's I where think we this are. is a really important part because i to take the point about if there's a plan or not i would be you i'm much more, plan i'm plan. much more terrified that there isn't one because what <laughs> i think we've got is weak authoritarianism capitalism in the last 15 years where it's been like a crapshoot arbitrary rather than robust planning about the combination of the state and the market how you can have big infrastructure projects but get out of our lives in the individual sphere it's what you touched it's gone the, it's the wrong way around so what they're doing is they're they're bolting on more regulation and control rather than the other way around so well actually how do we show enterprise and initiative and positive thinking in terms of solutions to come out the other side of it. Exactly. This. If you think about Britain, you think about wh wh whatever side you were on a Brexit and all of that, the whole idea, think about our, our coastal regions, think about infrastructure and development, retraining, biomedicine, tech, yeah. nuclear, all the different things that are now being talked about, but we could have a really robust set of implementations where you have what the government can do the best, issue bonds, get the industry and the private sector, which is really, it's exposed to a lot if they do it, and start productively investing again, get people People paid more wages they can then spend money instead what we have is this kind of risk averse step back in intrusion in our private lives increasingly but not in the but, arena that, that, that they should really be paradoxically in. that creates more risk so it's that paradox about we want you to feel secure we'll take away your freedoms so that then long term 
you're actually putting yourself at more risk it's because you've lost. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's yeah, totally exactly. crazy. That's that you know that's Can a crazy. Can I just come in uh, here? Yeah, sure. Sorry to interrupt, but two things. I want to set the scene a bit because not everybody's going to be able to see where we are. We are in the fabulous Hippodrome in the heart of London's West End. But it's, and this was what you were linking into what you were saying about the nighttime economy and um, the importance of of enterprise and venture. And the other thing I wanted to just take it back to a bit of more of a simple level. You gave us this fantastic 100 trillion dollars i'm feeling rich for the first time ever um can you tell us a bit more about the story of that i mean if i took this to zimbabwe today would i be able to use it and what does it mean for people well what happened is is zimbabwe these are actually um collector's items now and they're pretty rare to get these the real ones they, you can buy a fake chinese one but this is an actual real one so you should plasticize it actually if i somewhere. use scottish notes in england it. it's basically <laughs> the same thing i think but so so what happened there were a couple of places you had the weimar republic which had yeah. you know you had to bring in a um wheelbarrow filled with with notes, German notes, when the they had hyperinflation. When you get into a hyper, hyper this is the biggest um, note that was ever made in circulation in history because right. the hyperinflation in Zimbabwe because they were printing so much money. And, and what could you control. buy with it? What did that mean? Well, I mean, I, I think a chapter in my book, I have a, the $50 billion egg was right, the, chicken was the or, yeah. well, you could buy an egg for $50 billion in, in Zimbabwe dollars. So I think that that was significant of what happens in modern monetary theory when you have lots of debt and you just keep printing money because you can't. And so what we were saying is what's happened is the central banks, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England have created what's called moral hazard. So in other words, what, what they're telling the biggest gamblers is, the biggest gamblers are saying, well, heads I win, tails you lose, right? Too big to fail, too big to bail, too big to jail is too big to exist. That's got to be the bottom line, and it's not, because what happens is you have infinite bailouts for billionaires. That doesn't work for anybody anymore, well, and that's, why we're, that's, that's where we economy. are now. Where are the balance for the real economy, and this is the important no, thing. No, they're the suckers. Exactly. They're called... Oh, same as it always was. I mean, in right. terms of the lessons of history, that's always right. been a pattern. Tax it's donkeys. The, yeah. The tax donkeys. But people are unaware of this. Look at the cost yeah. of living crisis. Right. It's a perfect example of that, how that's all interlinked as well. But... If you look at, say, the, the quantitative easing program in the UK's mm -hmm. point of view, over, right. let's say, 2008, 2000, I think we're looking at a total of, what is it, 900 billion that's been pumped into the economy. But whether that's gone back to the real economy. But you see, this is the, the problem with, with money printing, insidious money printing like we have right now, is you don't know who's actually being bailed out and who isn't. You don't know what yeah. the debt obligations are. So the problem, you can't do that. We have a mechanism in normal business, and Alan can take pick up on this is it's called bankruptcy right <laughs> you know when you don't make money you go bankrupt and that's it you shut down your doors you don't get you know it's like an alcoholic I'm gonna give you one more drink just one more drink one more drink one more drink and so the problem is just compounding itself and that's the that's what's happened with the heads I heads I win tails you lose scenario and it just keeps going and going but and going. So where do we go from here in terms of how do we address that? What well, are the solutions? We, we're, we're, the problem that we're going to have, there's going to be a lot of opportunities going forward, but you're going to have insolvencies, you're going to have massive bankruptcies, and you're going to have to have uh, the you know a closure of the businesses that are not profitable because it just can't go on like this. But the, we have a leadership crisis, and that's where the real issue is. And we haven't had any real leaders or leadership. That's... Where we I think that's really true. I, I mean, just if there's a few basic things we could say. Um, five million new houses being built in the UK, yeah. right? Why is there an obsession that your house is an asset? I know, I know some people don't want to address this because their base might get affected because a lot of people invested in this now as investments, like many wealthy people have invested in art rather than in productive investment or in wine. However, um, young people can't afford to buy places. We could have far more people paid in terms of uh, uh, builders and construction, and we could have an, a range of development regionally um, about house building. That's one example, right? Um, training in a range of areas for IT, biomedicine. We have to allow companies to fail, but also provide, underpin for a temporary period, new training, new investment, robust development. And I think that leadership is really important. But we, right, one thing about Together is we try and encourage everyone to take a lead and have a say. We've got local elections coming up on the 5th of May uh, to hold uh, candidates accountable, ask them key questions, but also nationally with governments and the opposition and for people to take a bit more of a lead and say it's not being done well enough 
we think we should do this because we have to be active agents in in having a shape on where we're going and i think it's really important that on the one hand you've got this kind of economic uh, uh, in, in, incompetence, right? We have to have an improper strategy. Now, there are there are some good things being suggested, finally, around energy policy. They're not enough. If you look at France, for instance, 70% of its electricity is funded by nuclear. We've dropped the ball completely with that, right? We could do much more, much better. But at the same, so there's the economic part, but the whole point about risk and our, and our approach towards it and our ability to be bold and think outside the electoral cycle, right? Not every few years, yeah. but do we have 10 year, 20 year? Can we have a Manhattan Project style thing where we pull together resources and we're really dynamic? That's the whole thing, it's short termism everywhere. Exactly. And I think that that, and then, then the question about is there a plan? And I think we should talk about, and then we're gonna talk a bit more about like the digital currency things and certain international organizations. They look so big and, f- and powerful and influential in the absence of strong leaders domestically with sovereign leaders and also in the absence of a strong public sphere, right? What we've seen evacuate from the political landscape in the last two or three decades is ordinary people, right? Where, where, where are ordinary people? In the, often we're treated with contempt and disdain. I think we saw that in the last two years, right? It wasn't, it was kind of, at first everyone volunteered to come out, almost a million people, and we were shut away, shush, do as you're told, disdain, right? But, the, but actually, we've got such an amazing potential to harness creativity, right? And even when, you know, the thing about industrialization, things change, right? So we have to retrain and we have to be agile and we have to do those things. And it seems to me that one of the fears about a plan as opposed to people that are just like incompetent, they're doing some things that make a short termism. So as you say, short term returns, but don't think about the consequences properly and don't think about broad long term planning. Then other institutions end up looking much more dominant and powerful than they actually are. Now they do have an influence and we have got a world now where much more, it's much more about bureaucrats and tech. But Alan, do you genuinely think that governments want to empower people like that? And that obviously t- ties into all aspects, whether it's energy or finance and so on, or do you think that actually the governments, they, they're saying the whole time they want to let the people take back control. Or is it the opposite? Old, yeah. I think it's the other way around. Yeah, here. Once, you, once you stoke the fires of authoritarianism, and it applies to anything, whether it's finance or energy and so on, then they try and claw more and more freedoms. So that's my concern with that. I, well, I, I think I it's a very good vision. concern. I think it's a really good concern. But they never give it back the, once the they have exactly. it. Well, but the thing it's is, we trip. should never allow it to be taken. And the point is that I'm just say that when everyone, a lot of people talk about these people, and how, they're weak. Often they're incompetent. They're, they're playing it bit by bit. Right, they're, they're, each thing is short term, and actually, we have to get much more confident. And I believe truly that ordinary people can shape locally and nationally, have an influence on elected representatives, make them more accountable, make them more honest, but also take a lead yourself. You can end up saying, "Well, if it's not good enough, what am I going to do about it?" it? Work. And they may get nervous. I'm not particularly interested in what whether they're nervous about it or not what i'm interested in is how democratic and how open and how much we can improve this is what our lives right but you've shown this with together how that can happen at community level it's been great but if you look going back in terms of history a really good example and we're talking we're going around the actual phrase we're talking about and that's galvanizing people power so if you look at for instance remember the poll tax protests mm, just that about. caused how old are we <laughs> oh god i'm showing our age here but I, I remember that and it was a huge thing in scotland because it was seen as a temp it was yeah. rolled out there first and that was almost like the trojan horse of the the, the fall of thatcher because yeah. she went too far with, with a policy that was badly thought through it was taking control away from people and it was just a bad financial model in terms of taxation. So, it, And then the people stood against that. But they, they didn't government. stand enough against lockdowns, did they? But that's this is where it comes back to wider discussions But it, in terms of why that happened. But there's so many different components back to the perfect storm in terms of governments taking control away from people and taking it themselves. But then you've also got the role of the media in this as well. But if you look at it historically, you're absolutely got, right. Right. If you look at the things that have made a difference, the suffragettes didn't ask for permission. Exactly. Civil rights, Martin Luther King, peaceful demonstrations, but they walked out on the streets and they convinced people of the efficacy of their ideas. They engaged with them, they won hearts and minds. It wasn't legislators that were smart in the in the senators or others that just said we're going to now issue legislation. It was ordinary people demanding on the streets. That's always historically also, in the modern it period. It could be a trigger when you least expect 
expected. Look at Rosa Parks, for instance, as an exa example. The same thing could happen here. So, Can I just come in about the whole issue of is there a plan? Because I think we're going to be talking about that a lot all the way through the series. I mean, it occurs to me, in very simple terms, the countries, the nations that do have a plan, the regimes are the ones that are the greatest threat. You know, you look at the Chinese regime, they think in terms of 100 years, don't they? Um, you look in terms of what President Putin is doing now. I mean, there's a huge picture plan going on there. Um, so maybe there's an argument that we, we need a plan, that yeah. a plan is but not necessarily right a bad thing. If you look at Britain going back again in the lessons of history, I mean, you could argue that Britain's going kind to of golden hour in terms of having forward thinking and legacy and so on was the Industrial Revolution. So you know, Britain's been in that space before. But I think it comes back to the point we've all touched on, is we basically get to a situation whereby governments, especially a lot of the Western governments actually, have been asleep at the wheel for decades. And it explains a lot of the measures that have happened now, where it's react and it's, it's taking away power from people because it goes back to the principle of what I thought about at the start. They were panicking. But I think from that panicking, they, they have then attached more aspects of control on. And this comes back to, but where is it going next? Do you, I mean, do you think the model of this is all streams go towards digital ID or do you think it's towards something more than that? I, well, I think there's a couple other problems that we need to chat about quickly before that i think that what's happened is we, we've seen such a rapid change in two years my head's still spinning about it yeah because what we've got now is we've got everything is about race gender and identity politics yeah. right so what's happened here that i see this is what this is is a, is a class war disguised as a race war designed to create division and tribalism so you don't have unity like together needs to have everybody like you're saying to fight a common cause against government do you think tyranny. It's deliberate manipulation to do that. Oh, it is absolutely. You know, you can you can just look at it carefully. That's exactly what it seems is going on. Because in the UK, so the UK, the problem is taxes right now. Look, the 2019. If you look at if you look at what the Tory manifesto said, it was a pack of lies. If you look at what you got delivered as opposed to what you got promised, and then they're going to come up with all kinds of excuses that you I don't want to hear. I'm surprised by this. But, <laughs> but wait, but, here, but, thus, right? yeah, but, here's the, but here's the problem. Here's the rub. So taxes are at a 70 year high, child poverty is at an all time high, energy prices have doubled, which are eviscerating the, the OAPs. And most of the people are like, wait a second, I can't pay this energy bill. And this is only the beginning because inflation is probably t close to 20%, if not, it's headed that way. Right. And the can way that they calculate it... explain that to people? And I think perhaps you're going to go on to do that, because this is what a lot of experts like yourself will say. You can talk to people, they say, actually, in inflation is not 7% or 6 right. point, whatever. Well, yeah, it is I was actually gonna, I was going to get into that. The reason why inflation and governments will never tell you what the real inflation rate, and the United States is more famous than the UK for doing this. And I got into a dust up with the ONS about the way they calculate their statistics. And I said, well, the reason why is because all payments like for um, social uh, welfare entitlement programs are linked to their inflation indexes and pensions are linked to inflation related indexes. So the pensions are already bust. And I do, do uh, dedicate a chapter in my book to pensions. So if you have inflation at the real rate, then the, the pensions can't pay out and they can't afford to pay the interest on the massive amounts of debt we've been talking about. Like the United States debt, the total amount of debt they have when you include Social Security and uh, Medicare and Medicaid programs is close to $300 trillion. So they give you a headline number, which doesn't cover their legally binding financial obligations. This is what you need to talk about. And people understand that the government's lying about inflation because when they go to the market, the supermarket, and they say, wait a second, this butter has doubled in price or milk has doubled in price. All, I can't afford this stuff anymore, but the government tells me it's only 8% inflation. How can that be? Have my What have my wages gone up? Oh, sorry. When you inflation adjust wages back to 1981, they're lower now than they were back yeah, then. But what's happening is that governments and media are manipulating the truth about why all this is happening. Well, that's media. The, you, exactly. ha you have to add the media. Media. There's no such thing as fake news. It's outright dishonesty yeah. is what it is. Well, it's, I mean, there's a lot of very difficult questions, right, that we're talking about. But one thing I would say, because you mentioned Margaret Thatcher before, and we've talked about they've been asleep at the wheel, you said, James. And I think that the collapse of ideological differences and the kind of... Blairitization of like Cameron and others, everyone became the kind of central. Where they all agreed is 
they were estranged from the public and what needed to happen was the public should be treated often with contempt and there should be control and there wasn't an attempt to win hearts and minds and really inspire transformations and so then when we look at what then happens right is the public is disengaged there's often quite a lot of cynicism and distrust now we've got a situation where those bureaucratic leaders the technocratic leaders that want technocratic solutions they want to engage hearts and minds there are international institutions, let's name them now, like the WEF, the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, and others, the International Monetary Fund, that have ideas that are often technocratic and bureaucratic, and they resonate with some people. Where the gap is, I think, today, is the sense of our own strength and what we can do to assert and influence things. And also, this is really important, right? the influence you can have in your own nation state on elected representatives. So any international institution can say what it wants. And if you can assert your own control and you can hold people accountable in your own nation state, you can limit and you can steer the direction of those things. Now this is really important because technology is happening and that's a great thing. I'm not a Luddite, right? I really like the idea that technology can help transform things. Yeah. Digital ID is not necessarily a terrible thing in and of itself. I think it can be very useful in many As long contexts. as applied in the right way. Privacy and rights and freedom are really important and essential. So if you think about historically the discussion, whether it was, and this is true about radio and transmission and cinema and TV in terms of everyone panicking about how out of control it would be, either because it would poison the minds or it would be used by people to corrupt the public, right? We have similar technophobic, technophile discussions now, but there are essential issues, right? That if you have digital ID everywhere and then it's firstly on the one hand used to where you can and can't access things or what money you can and can't spend or if you look at what Trudeau did with the truckers in terms of seizing accounts those kind of issues around digital ID are important to challenge and be, but it's also the case that digital ID if you if you if you've got your stuff digitally uh, in, in terms of health and you have your health responder handling it with you then that can be a really good transformation but there's a fine line because people quite to quote Huxley, exactly. and some people quite like enjoying their servitude. They quite like their creature comforts. And if that's in terms of accessibility as well, if they can swipe or just show a particular screen and bundle that together, a lot of people quite like that convenience. I, Isn't that a good thing though? That, that is a good thing, but it's the point that you touched on. is a fine line between that and cloak and dagger of bundling aspects, so whisper at social credit systems that may well come in with future legislation. We know some of the legislation that's coming down the tracks on that. Well, can, I, can I just say on this, this yeah. is, I think it's really important because actually 300 or 400 ATM machines were, were closing yeah. down a month before lockdown. In 2018, people were talking about it, right? So people were moving towards, but it still left a couple of million people, older people and others who couldn't do it. And that's an important thing. Online banking, things like that. They still need banks. They, and cash is really important. But if you, do, you, you can look at some places where they have implemented it. You mentioned China, but in India they've got 1.3 billion people on the Aadhaar system, right? And over a period of eight years, right, with biometrics and digital, and there are concrete examples of some people who are just not, some people are starving because they can't even access some of it, and it is about data and control, and people very rarely talk about it because you've obviously got a caste system well, still in India. There's also the other aspect of that, it's about people who get isolated because they're not part of that <coughs> process. For instance, you touched on the elderly and the vulnerable with retail outlets of financial houses closing and also ATM. There's millions of people, especially the over 65s, who do not have that access to online banking in any shape yeah. or form. But I think that it's a much bigger concern than that. I get a bit worried when the debate over the disappearance of cash is viewed yeah. primarily through the prism of poor old people, they don't know how to cope with online banking. Yeah. There's something so much bigger about this. And right. when you talk to pe ordinary people, have no inkling of this they just think oh it's really convenient i can now just use like, my yeah. absolutely and you know i i remember being quite pleased when you know a contact list the 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 cap on that was lifted and so on it, it is very convenient and then you just take it back a moment and say hang on do you realize that that means that if we go down this route wholesale and there is no cash the government has the ability to track every transaction it's, it's, that yeah. you do and of course tax you accordingly and then begin to mold your behavior and i think that the way that it is 
presented um, you know through the poor old people we're worried about them of course that is important but without people understanding the bigger implications well, of that, this that is a real there's also certain, yeah. certain <laughs> sectors requiring that cash flow old cash flow to, yeah. to actually exist and there's certain people that because of the status in life or whatever it is they rely on that as well it should always be part of the mix it comes back to choice again so if someone wants to go down that digital online route mm -hmm. fine but there should be the traditional alternatives. But so what happens is you get you get on a really slippery slope that goes right towards dictatorship yeah. and tyranny. And this is what you don't want to do. And you know this goes back to the, the oligarchs of Silicon Valley being allowed to run wa wild and roughshod over everybody's rights. And they've become it's, we're in a, in a world now with digital tyranny where they can control elections. They created a program called Google created a program, and I wrote about this in 2017, called Dragonfly. I don't know if you know what that is. Mm, I don't. What's Dragonfly that? was a, the first social credit mechanism used to oppress people in China. And a lot of the people at Google complained about it, and they said, oh, no, we're not going to ever unro uh, unroll this or, or roll it out. And, of course, not only have they rolled it out, but they're using it here. So social credit mechanisms have been around since Google, Google created them. How did it work, the dragonfly thing? What was it? It's the same sort. Well, basically what you were saying, so yeah. what, what the governments will have an ability to do is if they don't like you, they can say, oh, you spent money on something we don't like, so yeah. we're going to shut off your credit card now, or yeah. we're going to starve yeah. you to death, and you can't do this and you can't do that. So while, while there is a need for digital, there's always gross overreach, like Theresa May's Snoopers Charter. That's yeah. where it all started to go wrong in the U.K., you know, and you have a lot of problems like this going on in the United Kingdom. Like our energy supply, I did a, uh, I had had a sit down with Defra. Can back we just, in can we just talk about that bit first before, because the energy is a really big conversation. But I just wanted to come back on what you said about the, the, this thing on um, the digital tracking, yeah. bit, because it's, it's really, really, really important, important, right? Important. And in terms of no, it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Well, I just think that you're, you're right that that's the danger, but I think it's a political question because technology is technology. And we know that with the big tech companies that there's been relationships with the state, there's a question of the military relationships and back ends that are brought in with intelligence services and everything. We know that's happened. Right. But it's also the case that it's actually often the big tech companies didn't want necessarily to be the arbiters of free speech. If you look at the online safety bill in the UK and you look at the EU who've just passed legislation, 400 million citizens now in the EU now are, it's been outsourced to big tech to become the arbiters. The, the politicians have said to them, a bit like they, the politicians did with the Bank of England in the UK 20, 20, a couple of decades ago, well, we don't really want it, you handle it. That's what's happened, a lack of leadership, a lack of a sense of clarity, rather than saying we are going to censor you. Right. They like to say we're against woke, this government, Just to, this is an important point for people to understand. Right. We're against the woke thing, or we don't like this cancel culture, so we're going to have freedom, but actually what we're going to do is we're going to have an online safety bill. Yes, there's issues around children, but now they're going to treat all adults like children, and that gets imposed on big tech. Because it does strike me that if you're in tech, you're always looking at technological solutions to things. And you might get carried away with that a bit. And some people get a lot of money and they get very influential. The issue is we've lost our ability to assert ourselves politically about our rights and our freedoms, right? That's the bit. Because as but it happens... Yeah, but here's the problem. Just a final yeah, point about yeah, this. Because yeah. it's like, as it happens in China... Their social credit system is behind time. It isn't actually, it's terrible they've got it, but you only have to look at Shanghai to see what's actually happening, right? It's not like they're pretending who they are, right, in China. But actually in Mexico and India, we've got elements of that happening. And what we've seen in here should give anyone, even if they don't agree with what we're saying, right, should give anyone pause of thought, which is that whether it's about you recycling your stuff and the, and the council fining you for not doing it, or if it's about giving money to a political organisation or going on a demonstration, if they have the ability to limit what we do but through a digital ID and central bank digital currency and having that all together, that provides an enormous problem. It may not happen, but the, the concern bus. around it Call is it. really... But, really here's, yeah, but here's, here's what you also have to consider. I, okay, I give you that. But what you've got to look at are the incestuous relationships between government and big tech. Big tech owns government, okay? This is a fact. I mean, look, you get people that go out of government like uh, Nick Clegg, for example. What mm -hmm. is Facebook yeah. paying him tens of millions of dollars? We have no idea how much he's making. And his first promise when he got elected was, I'll never raise student tuition. And that's the first thing he did. So can they be trusted? I don't think so. So you've got to look at everybody's motivations. And Google's playing both sides of the fence. You don't know what they're doing with China. China is a massive 
threat to democracy everywhere in the world. Nobody wants to say that. Nobody will say it because China will like shut off Disney, for example. If they have sensors. China has sensors in Disney's studios to say what you can put out in a movie and what you can't. So you've got to look at who's contributing. Google and Silicon Valley are some of the biggest contributors in Washington and Westminster that you can have. So they're, they're buying. You know, it's the U.S. Congress doesn't write laws anymore. It's outsourced to their biggest contributors. So, you know, you say that the laws, yeah, they have the laws on the books, but who's paying for those and who's but lobbying? This is where the real issue is. But this is the problem. We don't have any more say. The people don't have any say, and the politicians are pretty much laughing at us because it's one rule for thee and another for me. So so also, there's one other aspect to tie into this because yeah. it interlinked in terms of tech and also right. um, government. But then you've got the role of traditional media as well. If you look at, for instance, what's happened in the UK over the last year, two years, where pretty close to 400, 400 million pounds has been spent by the UK government mm. effectively funneling financial streams into our traditional media, so the media are not going to bite the hand that feeds them. They're t they're part of the problem as well. So you've got tech in terms of what messages go out and whether there's a sort of suppression there of a certain side of the argument of government who are putting that information out there. But then you've got media who are then reinforcing and amplifying that message. Well, and then the public are, are literally back from this going, I better stay in my place. Yeah. I'm going to get told what to do. I better conform. And therefore, it sucks the lifeblood of confidence and spirit. It comes back to Alan's point. So it's very, very difficult. So how do we get the maybe, vision of a better yeah, future when the public do. are bamboozled? Maybe they are. I, but I would also say this, right? And I, this is not to revisit an old discussion about Brexit and everything. But lots of big international institutions told people how stupid they were and that they were going to get punished and it would be detrimental. And people didn't listen necessarily. I think that we should not underestimate... Right, ordinary people. That happens everywhere all the time. I think there's a fatalism that happens. Let me ask you, this is really important because in our own, in the fraternity we I've been involved in recently with the anti-lockdown, there are a lot of people who at the start when we started campaigning said, why are you even speaking to MPs? Why are you even getting involved? Well, they're all bought, they're all done. And the thing is, it's like a fatalism that we cannot change or do things or that somehow everyone's part of this huge plan. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. It actually reflects the same thing that the government and leaders do, which is treat us with disdain as though we have no agency, no autonomy. Now, it is the case, and it always has been, that big industry has a big voice. If you've got a lot of money in an economy and society, you have a disproportionate voice, right? Always has been the case. Now, the monopolies and the mergers commissions of the past broke things up, and, but it's always been the case. What's lacking today, why it seems even more disproportionate, is because the public is not having enough of a say in it. And that's why it's really important. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but to to challenge the things that Mitch is concerned about, and I think rightly so, right? The lobbyists, the big... But I don't think everyone... I don't think it's as simple as saying everyone's bought because actually there's a series of things that happens. Short-termism... If you talk to any MP as it happens, right, they'll have a million things that they're trying to deal with. Okay. And I think that the point is that we have to be able to articulate rights and freedoms. And actually, if we think that it's like all going in one direction. Who's it incumbent on, right? It's incumbent on us as citizens to take a stand, I think. Right, but I'll give you two examples, two quick examples we can go to. When George Osborne hired a guy named Mark Carney. Mm -hmm. Mark Carney worked at Goldman Sachs. And then after Goldman Sachs, because he didn't, I don't know why he left, maybe he wasn't doing very well there. He went and became, he ran the Bank of Canada. And then when he went to the Bank of Canada after creating one of the biggest housing bubbles on the planet. Oh, George Osborne said, I'll have some of that. Maybe I want a housing bubble here. So he brought him over here and created an even bigger housing bubble here. So getting back to your Brexit example, everything that Carney predicted about Brexit and the carnage and the end of the economy and the end of everything never happened. Carney became politicized. He was hired for a specific reason by the government and he, he lobbied to get what he wanted. Now he's running climate change for different global organizations. That's one example. Now, Bill Gates, software developer, Microsoft, funded uh, Neil Ferguson's experiments at uh, Imperial College. None of them have been right. His model on bird flu was chronically wrong, still an advisor to Boris, and he's the one that orchestrated the lockdowns while he was sneaking out to see his girlfriend. One rule for thee, another for me. So Bill Gates had undue amounts of influence over policy. There are pictures with him and Savid Javid, pictures with him and Boris. Why is a software developer dictating our COVID policy? I know he's got some money, and I know that he invested in a lot of the vaccine companies, and I know that he 
tends to profit from that, but he shouldn't be dictating our policies. And it seems that the ancillary evidence that he funded the exercises at Imperial College that were totally wrong, that put us on the wrong path of what were we, what did he predict? Six million deaths by COVID, that, you know, yeah. in, in the UK. I always get nervous when, when we go down the Bill Gates route. I don't know about you, James, but there's so much of it out there on the Twitter sphere, the kind of conspiracy theories around Bill Gates. I, I can see you looking at me with that expression as... I totally You're disagree. getting used to the expression now. You'll see it a lot. You've seen, yeah. seen it a lot of the last few years. Yeah. Do you know what? I, I mean, I'm a great believer that when the evidence changes, you start contemplating changing your opinion. Mm. Bill Gates, there's a lot of stuff that's interconnected with Bill Gates. I'm not going down the rabbit hole of saying that he's a complete bad man and everything he does is that God delusion and is wrong. But there is interconnected forces at play here. I mean, if you look at also, for instance, his hoovering up of American land, in terms of farming guns, land, he's the biggest owner exactly. of farming land in America. But that's a fact. Those are facts. Those aren't conspiracies. That, that is yeah. out there. I mean, you know, he's been involved in terms of vaccinations before, and so, so there's good that there, there is good that's come off that in terms of some of the health. So there, it's not all he's a bad man, and it's all for bad reasons. But it's more about the individuals, I think, and this is where I stand on it. It's certain individuals who almost like have a kind of Midas delusion that they can, because of who they are. They can so, fix so Tony Blair, whisper it, may well have that same that. problem. Can I can I pick up on what Alan was saying about people power? Because this is one of the things I actually found hardest about the pandemic, that I became a bit disillusioned in people power. You know, I hope that there would be some kind of uprising um, against these extraordinary interferences uh, in our lives and and yet you saw people complying with the most insane completely unjustified restrictions and they did so in some cases actively almost enthusiastically um, and it sort of undermined my my faith in people, which is not a nice feeling to have. But Isabel, do you not think it's four different... I, thought I always come back to the theory of four different communities with this crisis. The first community is people like us. Mm. So raising their heads above the parapet and going, I'm really not sure about this. Mm. I'm going to find out more about it. Let's talk about the collateral damages and yeah. so on. The second community, it's a point that we've touched on, is about fear. Mm. People have, to an extent, been brainwashed and they are struggling to get through that. There's a complete loss of confidence. The third community, people whisper it, may well have enjoyed aspects of this. I think so. It suited their lifestyle, yeah. for yeah. instance, not to go into the office, not mm-hmm. to meet a bad boss, take their 80% of furlough, and 20% doesn't yeah. matter because they're not traveling anymore, yeah. stay at home, bake cakes, maybe do a bit of work. Yeah. The final community is the most important community, and this is the bit that I think interconnects everything that we're saying today, whether it's to do with sectors, whether to do with finance, to do with energy, and that is the silent majority. I think the silent majority have been largely appalled by what's happened in the last two years. They're a little bit scared by it, but fundamentally, this is a British trade. We're mm. quite a compliant nation. We are. We're rule takers. We are rule we takers. Like we, we know our place. We yeah. might tut a little bit yeah. or make some more tea. I mean, that's a massive generalization, <laughs> but we just don't want to break <laughs> through. Though, I know so it? many people who, for instance, are but we're conforming with these sometimes crazy rules yeah. because they just didn't want to get in tr- trouble. They didn't want their twitchy curtain neighbour to and go... There, and there were twitchy curtain well, neighbours. Lots of them. We, it's a snitch culture. Yeah. So we are the, we are the, we've had a civil war. We did, decap- we did chop off a, a monarch's head and <clears throat> we did give a lead to um, the Enlightenment and transform things for freedom and democracy where many people... Uh, pioneered free speech and were we stand on the shoulders of people who fought and died for freedom and we're the custodians of them so i think we can get a little bit into the and this is the point Mm. about the public or what people used to call the great unwashed or the mob and often it keeps rearing its ugly head pardon the pun in how policy people think about it and also how even people who are challenging things like lockdowns think about it you're all sheeple i'm not saying you're saying this but often we say they're all asleep i'm awake i've been telling you this forever it's frustrating because if you go into a pub and, you're and, a start, and start telling people that they're asleep and I've been telling you, how are you going to convince anyone? And I think we've got an enormous... Qu- and this is to your point. point, to all of your points, right? How do you get someone who doesn't agree or has got questions to get involved and discuss and think about things differently? Because I think there's a fatalism on both sides, for instance, of the lockdown thing. I think, firstly, the government... And they won the argument with a lot of people that what this was all about protecting others. 
And those that were opposed to the egregious measures, we were never able to really have as strong an argument. One thing that summed it up that said, we are protecting people by challenging these damages to freedom, right? And understandably, because people thought it was stoic to protect one another, and they were. Now, now the question is, how do you appeal? How, and this is a question for all of us. It's a question for all time, and why free speech is so important. With this constant attack on free speech, that the only way we can do it is when we can listen and uh, engage and understand one another and have arguments that convince and bring people. And you believe that your fellow citizen is capable of change and is an eight and not evil because they have a different idea. But getting back to getting back to Isabel's point, the point that she made about the public, it's very important because what the government did and what Ferguson did with the um, our government is they used utilized fear and that's what they always do. Fear so a, a, a fearful public is a submissive and obedient exactly. public. Yeah, yeah. So they get obedience. They don't want to hear have a opposing viewpoint you're not allowed to have that and everybody like i saw in pfizer's headquarters corporate headquarters in new york they have signs follow the science follow the science science denier racist science denier racist so you get this mantra by these people that call you all these vicious names and you shut up because you don't want to say anything science is a process where you question all the time, every hypothesis, time and time again, to try to see if there's a different issue. You don't just sheeple along and go, bah, It's not just follow the science, it's follow the, 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 the data. And that's actually one aspect I've seen over the last two years, where it was a pretty, it was a, it was a road less traveled in 2020, when, you know, obviously the cases and deaths, and the narrative was all about, you know, saving granny, you know, the kids have got to play a part of that. The coercion of the kids was a terrible thing. But it was a difficult position from our, you know, the kind of, We've got freedom fighters and against lockdowns to take at that point. But then over time, the data started stacking up and a lot of areas to say, well, actually, this road isn't the right path to travel. And so you start winning the argument, not just because science told us on day one, but because the data told us right. over a number of weeks. So, and so months. I think this is really, really important. But also just about your point as well, it's really I, um, I think firstly, people did there were protests and there were people that went out and organized and they did it and a lot of people put themselves at enormous risk yeah. uh if you think about cancel culture people talking about yeah. you think about people put their livelihood their risk yeah. that they got you know shut down and censored takedowns ridiculed for, for labeled anti-vax for doing the, yeah. oh, the, the other thing one. that makes you that, saying which is that, that which that science should be a process i mean how do you ever get copernicus or galileo if you can't question the uh, assumed authority of things and you test the hypothesis but I do think that it really the, the the thing is that I think so we've seen protests and demonstrations people said there were hundreds there were hundreds of thousands quite often and for the first time ordinary people that had never been on demonstrations or protests in their lives right had come along to them but also now what's happening I think when people see things like well actually did they really need to do this or what is it what, what hold about this transmissions and everything and you begin to see a chronology of things i think it's really important that we can keep assessing and presenting that and the cost of living crisis now right linked to lockdowns people want to talk about ukraine it's exacerbated things but actually the heating or eating question was coming down the pipeline way before the point about quantitative easing about debt about a lack of energy investment for a long time about the fact that vaccine mandates impacted uh, trade and ports uh, because of drivers and truckers, all those things have led to what we now are dealing with. And I think it's really important to keep having those arguments and discussions and winning people over to the idea that actually, if you want to not see things happen in the way that they have happened before, where we're treated with disdain and contempt, it's incumbent on you and each one of us to actually have a voice and say it. But it's also the point you touched, it's really good points about empathy, it's about the style of narrative and debate. When you see it on Twitter, I mean, it is just a cesspit. It's I mean, shrieking. It's terrible. But that's I don't. That's nothing like, and it'd be the You'd same for everyone else. You'd never do that, would you, James? Mm. You I would don't. Never, did you? Did you ever do that during Brexit? Well, I did notice some of the previous discussions that we've had. We were we were squabbling a did bit. You block, but we, did we you were, block me? Probably. Did you? did you ever block me? <laughs> I don't block anybody. Really? I don't think I block anybody. Okay. What well, I find weird, and actually this is a bigger thing, is I find myself blocked by people I've had nothing to do with. <laughs> yeah. What's that all about? Exactly. There's yeah, one or two notable ones as well. I won't name names here. But the, 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 the aspect of Twitter is not representative of real life, I think. So real no. life is, I'd, I'd take Alan's view on this, that whether it's to do with discussions about cost of living, whether it's Brexit, whether it's lockdowns, it's, it's about the neighbours test. It's about going around, having a conversation, having a glass of wine, going, and they'll say something about their lives, about their kids might be 
breaking out into a rash because they're wearing masks every day at school, or it might be about someone's job is hanging by a thread. People open up if they're comfortable and the other person is listening, or they feel that the other person's listening. They're not going to open up and say, do you know what, your view on something is idiotic. Mm. They're just going to go like that, and the gap goes bigger and yeah. bigger, and you see it yeah. on Twitter. So I agree with that point. Having conversations, slowly but surely, in sort of people's own hinterlands and local communities, and getting people to sort of empathise to the problems that are around them and go, actually, there might be another way of doing it. Now, the cost of living crisis, last thing I'll say on this, the cost of living crisis is really interesting because... While a virus stokes up fear, because it's unknown, when you look at the economy, and I'm sure you can touch on this, Mitch, when you look at the economy and finance, when things start heading south for individual household expenditures in terms of how much disposable income they've got, people might have a bit of fear, well, uncertainty, but they get angry. And actually what you want to do sometimes is turn and harness the fear into constructed sort of harnessed anger so people do start taking a stance, do start holding the governments accountable and actually say, well, we're not having this anymore because there's got to be a better way through that. And I think that actually the cost of living crisis is a slightly different dynamic in terms of people's headspace and mood yeah, it, compared to it's COVID. A, it get, to simplify it, you can say when people get hungry, you've got a big problem. Yeah, yeah. And that's where we are. And we're not too far away from that point where people are going to get hungry. And that changes the entire ball game. So no matter what the politicians keep telling you with their narrative, people stop believing it because they know they can't afford to feed their family. Mm -hmm. And then when you can't feed, to form your, uh, feed your family and the heat is not on, it, you're going to have a, cri a bigger crisis than we have. And for the government to say, oh, we're going to spend billions of dollars on Ukraine, we're going to spend billions of dollars on a train to nowhere, no matter how much HS2 is over budget. And we've allowed, you know, I, I worked with DEFRA back in uh, the early 2000s when I came here. I moved here in 1999. And I told them that, you know, with the amount of offline things you have in energy will go dark by 2025. And they laughed at me. But, you know, that's where we are now. And these were caused by lack of leadership once again. And and as I've said, not taking the... the uh, the time to replace aging generation and repair our gr national grid system so our, electric uh, our electricity was working properly. And that's one of the issues. Now getting back to what you guys both raised was the anti-vax thing. I, I spoke with one of the biggest media uh, companies here in the UK and had this discussion. And I said, you know, that's a really derogatory term. Yeah, sure. And I said, it's really negative. And what you're doing is you're trying to increase division and tribalism, which is what I said earlier in the, in the broadcast. I said, you know, you're trying to increase tribalism and division so that you get people fighting while the biggest economic plunder takes place, the most significant economic plunder takes place in the background and people don't notice it. Right. But th this is really, really... It's like Russian hybrid uh, uh, warfare right. tactics, isn't it? You know, you just sow that division and, you know, the whole anti-vax label uh, was just to delegitimize yeah. the but debate. You can't, you can't because, you know, and the first protest I ever went to was one of your protests. The, the actual, your mandate protest or anti-mandate protest because I thought it was a great cause. And that's the first protest I ever went to in my life. Well, what's interesting about it's been part of some of those protests as well and it touches on Alan's point, and I've been to quite a few of the together ones, is the diversity of people on those protests. Right. You know, people have got this thing what's largely self-employed or whatever, but it's, it's not. But people come from different backgrounds and I've loved meeting people at these protests and then them telling their stories about how they've come to that point sometimes for the first time ever, to actually have a protest. And I, but I do go back to the cost of living crisis. I think we're perilously close to people going, in their own heads, enough is enough. It was different maybe with COVID because it was fear, there was servitude, and also it was furlough as well. But with this one, when people feel that they're being hung out to dry, but you well, know, actually, what? because well, of we, neglect, we, we, we should we should look what at people think enough enough means because you yeah. mentioned the poll tax rights, but actually, when a riot in and of itself, there's very little that's constructive or creative yeah. within it. And I think the important thing is that um, having clear ideas about what to be done. You, it's as true of the Arab Spring if you look in Tahrir Square in Egypt, where you have all the potential of transforming things into democracy, but then you get some other people who step in because there's a yeah. vacuum of ideas and you get the worst possibility. And exactly. I think in the same way, that's why ideas are important. Also a sense that it's not fatalistic or defeatist, that it isn't just big this or big that. Like people say that you're all anti-vaxxers. It has been a debate, we've got to be honest, in the last 20 years, that big corporations and big this and big that, it's all terrible. And actually I think we've got to get um, better at challenge at 
yeah, banging the ideas. So this is a really important point. That comes back banging to the ideas between everyone and listening, and because the th the thing, because you did then say also the sheep bar when you was expecting. Because I agreed with everything you said up until then, but then you said the sheep bar. Now. If I didn't agree with you and I heard that, that would really turn me off. And this is my point. We've all got to get a lot better. And I, I'm, this is why the Ofcom stopping us being able to debate things or giving broadcasters warnings was so problematic. Because when the Remain Brexit discussion was going on, you could have different yeah. opinions on TV, right? And we, got, we saw people taken down, shadow banned, prevented. Many of us have experienced some elements of that. Um, by the way, they weren't together protests. We went there to, there was other people organising them, but we went there, and I think it's an important point. But you're absolutely right, there were lots of people that came for the first time. And I do, I think this point, this, like this central bank digital currency where the Bank of International Settlements, so the president said, you might spend your pesos, you might spend your dollar, we don't know what that is, but we will control it. There's a tendency for people who feel like they're, they don't have control of things, that they don't have a great plan, to be even more bureaucratic and technocratic with people they're estranged from, right? The mob, the, 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 the people. And what I think anyone who believes in freedom and rights and democracy, it seems so commonsensical up until recently, now seems a bit radical, right? But anyone who believes that, and let's be honest, that fight's been going on for a long time, Thomas Paine and others, right? Anyone who believes in that is our responsibility. Not don't look here and look at oh, because James is well known or is, but it's all of us. It's incumbent on all of us, right, locally, nationally, to take a stand in leadership because the only way we can guarantee, right, that the things that we're concerned about in terms of our freedoms, our rights, our privacy, so we don't get a social credit system that's like China or even like India, is if we insist upon that here and we make our case made and we have our voices heard, right? That is going to be the antidote. So Just we one. are going to come uh, later on in the series, aren't we, into what you can do to empower yourself, to, to kind of escape from the long arm of the state, as it were. But I just wanted to pick up on uh, what Mitch said about we get to the point where people are actually going to go hungry and that's when you get a tipping point. And um, I, I just wonder... Um, what does that look like? You well, know, yeah. when that yeah, happens, we've got a, we've got a lot of craziness going on in the world right now. I mean, if you look at how fast things have changed, you've got seven hundred genders, and you've got a lot of different things going on. Seven hundred, yeah, really? whatever it is, I can't count. It's too high. It's beyond my capability. But if you, if you think about what's going on, we need to have historic perspective on everything. Mm -hmm. And a lot of today's generation, they have like they, in the U.S., they've written the sixteen nineteen revision of history. And people want to burn his, history books, and you know this happened with ISIS, and this happened in 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 Germany, back in, you know before the Second World War, where they were burning books. We need history as a perspective, and to give you a perspective, and everybody here and the, our listeners a perspective on what the direction we could be heading. And I, I point this out in my book, Japan. Japan's economy, for 30 years, has been in the ditch. Okay, and I cautioned in my book that I said this is the direction that we're headed in where we have stagnation and we have zero growth because this is what happens when you print money and Japan is different from the US is different from here because what they're doing is forcing the pension funds to buy the bonds and bonds as you know fund the government and fund all their debt so what happens now in Japan we've noticed in the last couple of months their currencies starting to go out of control and bond yields are going higher which means the government, which had this policy called yield curve control, said, I'm going to buy all the bonds to keep the yields low. Mm. So they're printing money to buy the bonds, which makes the currency go lower. So now they box themselves like all the central banks in the world are in a very bad position. They, they have got, they've printed so much money that it's going to explode and we're going to have a exogenous shock that causes the coming credit crisis. And they needed to be blamed for that, which causes massive inflation which makes food costs, energy costs, and all costs spiral out of control. There are other factors that come in here as well. This whole Ukraine situation is another thing that's entirely problematic because Russia is the biggest producer of oil in the world. Okay, So the problem with all these sanctions that were not very well thought out against Russia is what's happened is now there's an alliance between Russia, China, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Iran. So the prices of oil are now denominated in rubles yeah. because that's the only payment, and in renminbi, the Chinese currency, and they've come up with a parallel payment system to the SWIFT system, 
where this is they they started setting up in 2014 after the coup in Ukraine last time. So what this has done is created um, two different opposing groups, and this is going to end U.S. dollar hegemony because now basically Russia is on a gold standard as well because they're backing their currency by gold. So this is going to cause food shortages globally. And if you go back and you look at, at the, the statistics on food from the IMF, I think in the World Bank, if you look, food prices have been going up since 2016 on a rise. Now we're at, medi medi you know, the, there's just been an exponential increase. And, and the, the, the cost of energy, oil is the lifeblood. You know, I know that we have the Green New Deal, net zero, which these two things are ridiculous because they're they're. Let's not go down that route. But that's a but, whole other episode. Right, but, but isn't they're it? impossible. They're impossible to do. Like you can't flip a switch and say we're not going to have any fossil fuels anymore. That's no. ridiculous. And I can tell you that doesn't work. And it's the not going to work. Defenders are going to we, say we've got till twenty fifty. Yeah, but we don't. But whatever. So yeah, yeah the twelve year and we're going to die. That's ridiculous hyperbole. So the the problem with that is is we need oil and. What will happen now with this alliance between China and Iran and um, and the other uh, component countries yeah. is that if Iran closes the Strait of Hormuz, which is yeah. entirely possible, yeah. Yeah. you'll see oil prices go to five hundred or a thousand dollars a barrel, and then you'll see a real disaster. So, two, two really one one is a really quick question just for sure. you, and the other is a much bigger question. Um, you mentioned Japan. I think a lot of ordinary people, if if they thought our fate is to end up like Japan, they would think, well, that's not that bad. You know, Japan's a pretty nice place to be, isn't it? They're pretty high um, quality of life there very high life expectancy pretty good sushi uh, yeah. it's not really my Divide idea with, of yeah. it's not my idea of hell in a handcart so can you just address well, why I japan lived, is so I lived, bad? I lived in japan but it's not so it's not so bad i lived in japan um and they're you know it's one of the three major financial centers in the world but it, it's i'm saying that their economy has been terrible for 30 years so in other words they haven't had any growth it's been flatlined okay. pretty much. So they've had no growth. So you have generations that have been lost because there wasn't yeah. growth and potential for them to buy um, property. Now, if you look at what we have historically in the world right now, we've got all the central bank money printing has caused the most grotesque asset bubbles in the property market, mm -hmm. the stock markets, and the, um, the bond markets and the credit markets. So we have grotesque bubbles yeah. and so when the first bubble pops it's going to cause all the others to pop so here's the big picture question a lot of the people that i would say are conspiracy theorists would say that when it gets to a tipping point when people are hungry and people are really angry then some kind of mysterious world forces will come up with another disaster whether it's another pandemic or you know um, cyber world, attack world war cyber attack, or yeah. cyber, yeah, cyber attack. Exactly. Cyber attack. Yeah, so I, russia did it and just to just to finish off what i was going to say that kind of theory is that that will be used as a device once again to repress populations. Is that your your prediction? You well, think there'll be something like that? I, I predicted a couple years ago. First of all, I said that there. I said that the one of the best trades. I said in 2020 or 2021 at the end of the year. I said probably one of the best trades is to be short sterling right now because I think sterling is going to go down. The other uh, issues that I said is that w we can see what happens first in the world is you have a trade war, which is what happened with the United States and China. Yep. And a trade war turns into, this I predicted back in 2016, a trade war turns into a currency war. And then a current from a currency war, you get into a hot war. Those are the three phases, and that's the process in which it happens. And it looks like that is progressing the way that it is. Now, um, I think what you will see when you have food shortages, you'll you could see civil war, and that's th those are realistic. That's not in, conspiracy. In developed countries, of course, when people are hungry. I mean, because look, it everybody says, but the government, the government will pay, to lose. right? The, the government will pay, but the government, you've already got taxes at seventy-year highs. How high can they tax, and where can they tax? This is the problem when you just print money willy-nilly. Do, do we need to, because I'm kind of conscious that we've talked a long time, we could sit here. I'm conscious uh, of the time as well. I mean, this yeah. has been an amazing discussion, but there's one last question I want to ask to tie all this all together. Solutions. Well, yeah, I think I think there will be a lot of solutions, and, and I'm very starting to become very optimistic, but I think that you've got to have valuations that are realistic. Yeah. 
And valuations, as I was mentioning, you've got the most grotesque asset bubbles in every asset class, except a few, which, you know, the people who are adequately postured for when this crash happens or the slow tire air out of the tires let out, you know, you'll be able to buy assets for five cents on the dollar or five pence on the dollar or whatever it is. But you're going to have some real fire sales because what'll, you have many people that are over levered and leverage is a really bad thing. I mean, it can, if you used it for, once again, like debt, if you use it for productive to, to produce goods and services, then it's good. But it's been, it's been bastardized, if I can say that, to create leverage so you can make enormous amounts very quickly, like the entire tech sector did. Mm -hmm. So the problem now is you have too many of the zombies. You need to shake out of the zombies and you need to get rid of the bad loans. And you can't have bailouts for billionaires again, because this is what we've done long term capital management, dot com, housing crisis, you just keep, you can't bail them out. And I, I know I've spoken to the kids or the younger generation who are involved in investment banking today. And a lot of them believe that the role of a central banker is to take their bad bets off their books and put it so on. So what you're saying is this that, is called that, moral hazard. That money is effectively distributed much more evenly across the real economy r rather than previously where it was getting effectively hoovered by those who need it least. It's, it's called misallocation of yeah, capital. Yeah. So, to, you, you know, when you put money into something, into a business model that can never make money, but of course it becomes, it's what it is, is like they say that they're going to taper. And I came up with a famous line that you can never taper a Ponzi scheme. And that's what these are. And that's Planet Ponzi. The whole concept behind that is all the government debt that's been put out there is a Ponzi scheme because they can never repay it. So they keep they keep issuing paper that's worthless. Eventually, you're going to have it. You're going to have sovereign debt defaults. Eventually. And ultimately, the people who pay the biggest price are the people who the tax don't yeah. Alan's so, gone weirdly Alan, quiet. Well, well, what quiet. do you think? There's a, you see, this is the th I think it's a, it's a good, really good question. There's so much going on. I really enjoyed it, and thank you. But it's a lot to think, and a lot to communicate. If you, but whether one thinks that there's a plan or not, and there are a lot of people who say that actually this is all part of a plan to take away property and assets from the majority of people and then a few technocrats will just run. And if you look at Klaus Schwab and others, that's what they've said and they'll do it. Doesn't account for Donald Trump and the trade war with China, doesn't account for what the Peshmerga yeah. might be doing, doesn't account for what's happening in Yemen. But that's, and then the thing about self-fulfilling plans that you don't have to really drill down on specifics about is that you can keep saying, oh yeah, but it's just another plan. Actually, human autonomy and agency, the ability for us to shape and curate the world, right, is the thing that's the antidote to it. Whether you think it's a plan or not, I don't care, right? I happen to think that the problem is it would be a lot easier if you just shine the light on it and go, there it is, everyone, yes. right? It was more out of control than that, more dangerous and more terrifying. And I think that if you look at what's happened like if with the EU recently and the World Health Organization that have contracted Deutsche Telekom to produce um, digital ID vaccine passports, that is an example of something that is perceived by the people who are doing it to be about health but actually has lots of draconian overreach and potential really damaging yeah. harms and that um, we have to look at things like that like the conversation about central bank digital currency and productive investment right of capital Mitch is talking about how you utilize that to what you think about what we're trying to do right get people paid paid more more development more housing better lifestyle improve the situation how about get people out of poverty as well and transform things have some ideas and visions about how we do that and i think in the end that gets back to something really old-fashioned right which is have these conversations and discussions try and win people to those arguments it used to be called politics right people go oh, politics now <laughs> but actually it's on us right because it is the alternative is all everyone's nightmare and horrors on mass because you can be guaranteed that if you want something to happen, the only way that we can make sure it does go in that direction if we end up trying to do it. Well, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy, but what we also have to do is communicate in the right way so people get it. They see the impact right. on their lives. They're not sort of seeing this highfalutin vision in front of them and it's too far ahead. You know, I've made mis mistakes before in the past where I've tried to discuss a particular concept that I think is happening on this, but it's five steps ahead of people. Right. It's too much yeah. for them. Nobody start, start, start talking about WEF or whatever, and actually people are more concerned day to day about a cost of living crisis, and they want to see a way through that and hold some people to account, and actually come back to Alan's point, some solutions. So I think we do have the responsibility 
to try and engage people and build audiences and build communities, but it's all about the art of how we do that with the terms of communication. So, Isabel. Yeah, I just want to come in on this whole issue of whether there's a plan, because that is going to come up in every yeah. episode of our podcast series. And my perspective on this is very much driven by my knowledge of politicians. I've been a political journalist for 20 years and just spent an awful lot of time with the people that are now running this country. Um, you know, the idea of Nick Clegg now in this incredibly powerful position in a, in a tech company. I mean, I used to go for dinner with Nick Clegg when he was a sort of nobody backbench, you know, uh, Lib Dem MP who would have ever thought he would become Deputy Prime Minister, never, never mind anything more international. And what that um, long experience of dealing with all these people and knowing them personally has given me is a sense that generally there isn't much of a plan. It is generally just kind of you making should. it up as you go along. Um, most things like are that. cock-ups and not conspiracies. I'll always remember, um, you remember Gordon Brown, um, long plotting. All he wanted was to become Prime Minister. All he wanted was to take over from Tony Blair. And this went on for years and it crippled and paralysed our, our government at the time. And everybody thought that when Gordon Brown finally got into number 10, having plotted and schemed about this for so long, he must have, you know, a, a big dossier, a plan of what he was going to do with his power. And the shock was to the people that were around him at the time who hadn't been part of all of this stages to get there was there was nothing. It's a hollow Easter egg. The, the, yeah. cu the cupboard <laughs> was completely bare. But you could argue the same thing so with that, Boris as that well. that has shaped my view on, generally, on um, whether there's a conspiracy or it's a series of sort of incompetent cock-ups. Do you really think Boris but Johnson has got some sort of master plan where all these rules... Not, are, not exactly. in the slightest. Exactly. But he does. He does have a plan. He's got a master plan. Or someone plan. else he's got, he's got the, 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 the Blair model to get out and get paid afterwards. That, and that's <laughs> what it is. To it's, yeah. it's survival. But I do think that there is now post the whole COVID experience that has somewhat sh uh, changed my view that there is a semi-plan out there which is being pushed by some very very That's powerful people and it's only a semi-plan but that doesn't make it any less dangerous people exploit a crisis but the so biggest a disaster yeah, but the, the biggest the biggest danger That's that we insane. face right now is that we've got to get rid of the debt overhang and the, the non-productive debt that's out there and this is why they're trying to create these digital IDs and the central bank currency because fiat currency is going to become worthless and they they're ahead of it they're ahead of the curve and they know that there's a crisis coming because they know that the numbers don't work. Yeah. This isn't conspiracy theory. Anybody who understands a basic balance sheet knows yeah. that there's a problem. Yeah. And th they know that inflation's over 20% unless they're, I mean, it's unconscionable that no, you don't know. Can I ask you how. one question, just touching on that? Do you think that, where we are right now with just what you've said, do you think that was a part of the plan going back at the start of the COVID crisis in 2020? Do you think that's evolved? Since well, no, I, I, th I think that that could have been. But, you know, as I was saying, that you have crisis after crisis after crisis. And what had happened when I, back when they had the housing crisis, and that's the, the writing of that book, was I told you, you can't bail them out. I, I don't know if you remember, but there was a savings and loan crisis in America back in the, in the 1980s, or I think it was the 80s. Anyway, it was when I was working on Wall Street. You know, I w went from Wall Street to Tokyo to here. And... Um, became a British citizen, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. But uh, the savings and loan crisis, what they did was they went in and they closed down the savings and loans and they arrested the people that committed crimes. And I said, that's the model you have to use this time. And if you don't, I'm going to write a book about it. And even Alan Greenspan, who was at the time the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that there were crimes committed and nobody got away with it. We don't need new laws. We need enforcement of existing regulations and laws. And I went on Sky to do an interview. And the, the guy said to me, I want to know who we have to bang up if there was crimes committed. I don't believe there were crimes. I said, well, LIBOR is one of them. He goes, are you kidding? I said, no, it's rigged. It's, you know, and he's like, he looked at me like I had three heads. I said, and he goes, well, tell us who did it. I said, it, that's not my job. I'm not a regulator. All that I'm telling you is that we need regulators and we need people who have business experience to be in those seats to help us, to help the people, because we need a government for the people, by the people, for the people. So, we so don't need a bunch we of really people need to is come a in. Piece of people with a plan. And that's the point, isn't it, right? What we need is some people with a plan and some ideas and constructs, because actually that. Uh, short-termism, the lack of planning and thinking about it, robust investment, and all of those things are reflective of people without a plan, right? And I think that that's the point. And so 
you know, it's a bit like... But that's authoritarianism comes in quite often. It can either come because of tyranny, it can also come in because they just don't have a plan and there's panic. So the way of covering up their own fault lines and ineptitude and lack of a plan is to basically hoover more power and stay. If we have this, we're going to keep you safe. But it's not actually answering the long-term question. Yeah, I mean, it was never about public... It was never about public health. It was about power, politics, and profits for big pharma ahead of people's but, lives. So one thing feast. we haven't mentioned at all in this whole discussion is crypto and the yeah. role of crypto. And I absolutely don't want to go there now because that is going to be a lot in the rest of our yes. in, in the rest of our episodes. And hopefully we can talk to you about that some other time. But sure. you might just want to give us just in a couple of sentences your view as to whether um, potentially cryptocurrencies are a way out of this for those who want to exercise some of people their... See, it's a lot, I know a lot of people see this as the holy grail of their own individual financial freedom. Is that correct? I, I Look, I, I think that crypto, I think Bitcoin will probably be the winner and you, yeah. Ethereum will be the winners. I think the others are shit coins, if I can say that. I don't know that I'm allowed to, but I, I think that if you have some risk capital, you should diversify your portfolios and everybody has to know what the risk tolerances are. But I think they're binary bets by that. I mean, yeah. I think that Bitcoin can either go to zero or it can go to a million. Yeah. But, you know, would I want to bet on that? No. I think that there are better ways to hedge your, your fiat uh, exposures right now. And I think what Russia's done by basing their currency on gold is going to be mimicked by China. And I think that all of those countries that I named are going to start developing currencies that are based on a basket of actual fungible commodities. So, in other words, yeah. I have this piece of paper Instead of a Zimbabwe $100 trillion note that's backed by nothing, I have a piece of paper that's backed by, I can exchange it for gold, silver, copper, oil, or a commodity. So it's actually backed by something rather than, what, what is a currency to begin with? Do you know, anybody? It's, a, it's basically, it's a promise to repay your debt. Mm -hmm. So this is what I was talking about with too much debt, too much credit, and too much leverage. With a fiat currency, it's backed by nothing but a promise to repay. And when people realize that the U.S. can't repay its debt, that's the end of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. And the, the problem that I think Alan brought up earlier with Canada and Justin Trudeau's tyranny, and he went in, and I know a bunch of corporate treasurers globally, when he uh, started going after personal accounts for contributing $50 to the truckers and st started they created a retrospective law that allowed them mm. to take away people's money. Yeah. This is the problem with having everything digital. Yeah. The government can right, but, yeah. but but and and they got away with it. So I know corporate treasurers that the next day, and the reason why they reversed that, I don't know if you noticed quickly, they did a 180 on that. The next day, I know corporate treasurers that took their corporate bank accounts all out of the Canadian banks, wow. and they had to run on their banks. Wow. And so, but they couldn't publicize this, that's and so that's why they they had to because look. And this is what's happened to the U.S. by shooting themselves in the foot with the sanctions on Russia. They're not a safe haven anymore. Because whenever a sovereign entity, a, a sovereign bank has sovereign immunity, a central bank rather, has sovereign immunity like the Russian central bank. When you seize their assets, they're supposed to be impenetrable. This has never happened in history. And when you take a central bank's assets away, nobody, you're a pariah now. I, I'm not going to keep my, no matter what happened, even in World War II, Hitler was keeping gold in the United States and everywhere around the world. But so, you know, when you take away uh, a currency from a individual or a government, you're setting a very bad precedent and people no longer will have full faith and confidence. Yeah, that was definitely a lot more than a couple of sentences. Well, just, there's a couple of things. One thing is the case that there have been many people who want to have bureaucratic, technocratic solutions before COVID. Uh, and have looked at things like digital ID for a long time. Tony Blair was trying to get it pushed through before, and now you've got a Tony Blair. Yeah. In, the, government, the British people didn't want what it. What Boris Johnson said in 2004 Free that he would sprinkle out his cornflakes. Yes, exactly. Times exactly. change. Exactly. And um, uh, But there have been people that have attempted to do that with the EU, with the World Health Organization and others, that they see that as a solution. Like people see the Internet of Things, yeah. or what they call smart citizens. And they're not all... People that are to, actually there's an, there's some merit in some really intelligent interactive interactivity with technology and our lifestyle. But the question is about our rights and our agency and who's deciding about really fundamental points, right? And privacy, because we can utilize. Is it in our benefit for everyone in that context or not? And that's the starting point. And the crypto thing I think is really interesting because 
Um, I, you know, let's remember that our central banks came around at a certain point. And people used to be lending kings money, and they were banished from those countries, right? Spain did it, Portugal did it, England even did it, right? It's what happened to a lot of Jewish people and others that used to lend money to uh, for wars and things like that. Then you had a central banking system came around legislation and policy i think one thing that people are underestimating is the fact that the fed and the irs and others in the us are hovering around bitcoin and everything and they're looking at what this is going to mean in terms mm. of how they regulate within the us and globally and bear in mind if you're a us taxpayer or a us citizen you pay globally and internationally and they still set many of the norms although i take your points about the kind of polarization now and what the, the concerns about a division of the world again because there are concerns around those things right as well as it mean that there's just not one hege hegemonic power. But I think that, you know, it's all right saying, well, I, those that can, and those that can afford to get Bitcoin and know how to use it, what it means and all that, right? But, but, but as it happens, if they just decide to legislate in a new way and do this thing and say, right, we don't care, this is the new rule and you are going to abide by it. Yeah, but the problem- Because, because after all, why don't people, it's a bit like anyone, anyway, there it will be the whole discussion about income tax, about who's paying, who's in control and all of that. Now you can say, well, it's not susceptible to that because it's just the way you transfer it and everything. I happen to know some people that are doing something that think it's going to supersede all of this, right? They're going to do transactions 100,000 a second and they've been involved in some big... Who knows, right? I think the question is, it depends, Yeah, but right? central bank... It depends. I think it depends. Yeah, but central bank digital currency is not going to be decentralized. That's the problem with yeah, it. Okay, so that won't true. work. It's yeah. a non-starter. So all they're doing is replacing their crappy currency, their fiat, with a digital currency. Guys, when it's decent... I'm going to break in here. Yeah. Because... That was a big interruption. It was a big interruption. <laughs> oh, it was authoritative. I'm conscious, I'm conscious of time. Um, yeah. Thank you. We could go on, couldn't we? we this could. is the least amount I've spoken in quite some time and, but that's the whole point of this we're here to learn from the experts in this field so listen thank you for your time Mitch it's been a great discussion also as well. thank, thank you. you and we also thanks to, thanks well. to the, I think we need to say thanks to the Hippodrome as well it was a very suitable place to have this conversation we as well we came in here. did you notice the the cash the um, amazing flooring they've got which is made out of One coins thousand. absolutely beautiful Brilliant. so yeah it's all about money it comes down Follow to that, money. all the roads lead What did lead you there. say in your tweet? Follow the money, but you had that... Oh, I did too many tweets. Follow the money. Um, the problem is that the money is always something, I Exactly. Know. Anyway. You know, once you can see it, you can't unsee it or something, something like that. Like anyway. That. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. It was fantastic.